Shalom, everybody. Welcome to this week's Journey Through Torah. We've got a lot of stuff to talk about today. We're still in the book of Bamidbar. We're still in the wilderness. We're still, we're still learning about how to live in the wilderness, and we're still learning about our actions, our words, uh, the things that we're doing, and how we live life matters. It's relevant to uh, being a people that are set apart to Yahweh, even in this life. Even uh, we know the, the, the destination is, uh, is, yes, we know where we're going, but it's not just about the destination. Uh, a lot of life is about the journey. And uh, this is life near. This is here. This is now. This is what we're working in uh, to see his kingdom here and now. And this portion is no exemption to that. In this parsha, uh, we find a, a gentleman by the name of Pinchas who acted quite violently, actually. And um, we, we see there's some strange twist of events and some things that, that happened here. But we're going to look into this and find out what's really happening uh, and what is really the scripture is really opening up and trying to show us. Now, if you just open up this portion of scripture and just read it from here, um, or at the end of last one, you know, you're reading in Numbers chapter 25, you, you'll, you'll be shocked, quite, quite actually, honestly. I mean, you'll be shocked is what happens. But what we learn is that Pinchas, he did not act of his own accord, so to speak. He did not act of his own mind. He was following through with what had already been established and what had already been set in order and set in place for the people of Yahweh. Now here... If you back up a little bit and you go into last week's Parsha, we find that Balak hired Balaam to come and to curse Israel. Well, this didn't work very well. If you go back, you read the story, you'll find that Yahweh told him that you cannot curse them and you will only speak what I tell you to speak. So he could not come out and curse them, but he instructed Balak in how to put a stumbling block before the people of Israel, how to get them into idolatry, adultery, and, and have them uh, break covenant with Yahweh, and how that would bring a curse upon themselves. Okay, so this is what's going on. And uh, Yahweh is saying the people who, who sinned against him, they will die in, in this plague that is going forth. And so he said to kill those who were involved in this. Uh, do not allow this idolatry within Israel. Do not allow this idolatry within the camp. And what we find is Moses and the elders, uh, Aaron, I mean, here they are. They're at the, the, the entrance of the tent of meeting, and, and they're weeping. They're crying out. They, they cannot believe what's going on in front of them. And Pinchas, we find he, he grabs a, a spear. He goes into the tent of a man who paraded his idolatrous uh, a, a, a woman in front of in front of the tabernacle, and and they go off to commit uh, adultery here, and so he takes them and he pierces them through, and there's there's some interesting things that we find in this portion. All right, so that's kind of like a an extreme summary of what's going on. So let's kind of back up a little bit and let's go back to uh, Numbers 25 and let's start reading in verse 10. So Yahweh says to Moshe. Pinchas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel in that he was jealous for my jealousy among them so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore say, behold, I give to him my covenant of peace and it shall be to him and to his descendants after him the covenant of a perpetual priesthood because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. So there's a few things that we've got to see here. This is our, our main portion of scripture we're going to look at today. But what we need to see is who was Pinchas and what was his responsibility within the Mishkan? What was his responsibility in being there? So to see this, we have to back up a little further. Okay, so we're still in uh, Numbers 25. Let's back up to verse 3. It says, So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Take all the chiefs of the people, hang them in the sun before Yahweh, that the fierce anger of Yahweh may turn away from Israel. And Moshe says to the judges of Israel, Each of you kill uh, those of his men who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. Verse 6. 
And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moshe and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel, while they were still weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. And when Pinchas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose and he left the congregation. He took the spear in his hand. So what we find here is, first off, Pinchas was the son of Eliezer. He was Aaron's grandson. Now he was, which means he was still a Levite, all right, and and he was still a, a descendant from Aaron. So here he is. He he has a responsibility here, no matter what. But he did have a task at hand, and so here he is. That he's with this congregation. They're crying out. They can't believe what's being done. And here, this man parades this woman in front as he's going off to commit idolatry with her. Okay, so why did Pinchas take it upon himself to go do this? Now, keep in mind, he paraded this woman in front of the tabernacle right by the door, because that's where these people were, right by the entrance to the tent of meeting. All right. So keep that in mind as we as we keep reading. Let's look at First Chronicles 9, 17 and 20. It says that the gatekeepers were Shalom, Achav, Talmon, Aiman, and their kinsmen. Shalom was the chief. Until then, they were in the king's gate at the east side of the gatekeepers of the camps of the Levites. Shalom, the, the son of Korah, uh, son of Eviasaf, the son of Korah, and his kinsmen to his father's house, the, Ko, the Kohathite, or the Korahites, were in charge of the work of the service, keepers of the thresholds of the tent, and their fathers had been in charge of the camp of Yahweh, keepers of the entrance, and Pinchas, the son of Eliezer, was the chief officer over them in the time past, and Yahweh was with them. So, the keepers of the entrance of the tabernacle. So here, what was Pinchas' responsibility? To He was a keeper, a watchman, a gatekeeper over this door of the tabernacle. He was not to allow uh, anything unclean or idolatrous come past the threshold of this door. And he was uh, to tell people this is what they were not to do. And if he would need to need to uh, result to force to do so, he it was his task, his job that the holy things were not to be encroached upon. So he's keeping this this whole area in the sanctity of Yahweh. It was his task to keep this area as Yahweh had declared it to be. Right. So this is personal. OK, so uh, when he when when this man parades uh, this this Midianite woman in, in front of the, the entrance of the door. It's now became Pinchas's responsibility. OK, so is, is he going to stand there or is he going to take action and do what Yahweh had said? Keep in mind, too, Pinchas it says he was the son of Eliezer. So he followed in the task of his father. He followed in the task of his tribe. This was a position that was passed on and on. Uh, Numbers 3.32 says Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, was to be chief over the chief of the Levites and to have oversight of those who kept guard over the sanctuary. So it was th this family's task to guard over the sanctuary, to guard it. Well, why would the sanctuary need guarding? Would it need guarded from who or from what? And probably both. Okay? Because not just from who, but from what as well. So where are they given these instructions to actually literally set guards in front of the sanctuary to not let people in who aren't supposed to be there? Right? People with, uh, uh, in, uh, with evil intent or uh, people who, who want to bring defilement and, and all of it. Right? Why would they need this? Um, numbers 18 is where a good place for us to look. Go back to Numbers 18. And let's go verses 1 through 7. So Yahweh says to Aaron, You and your sons and your father's house which, uh, with you shall bear iniquity connected with the sanctuary. And you and your sons with you shall bear iniquity connected with your priesthood. And with you bring your brothers also, the tribe of Levi, the tribe of your father, that they may join you and minister to you while you and your sons with you are before the tent of the testimony. They shall keep guard over you and over the whole tent, but shall not come near to the vessels of the sanctuary or to the altar, lest they die and you die. Verse 4. They shall join you and keep guard over. Look, they're to guard over what? The tent of meeting for all the service of the tent, and no outsider shall come near you. Look at verse 5. And you shall keep guard where? 
over the sanctuary and over the altar, that there may never again be wrath on the people of Israel. So here we're given that uh, they were supposed to guard over the sanctuary and all the implements and the services and the altar, everything that was to be done there, and keep guard over Aaron to protect him as well. Let's keep reading verse 6. And behold, I have taken your brothers, the Levites, from among the people of Israel. They are a gift to you, given to Yahweh, to do the service of the tent of meeting. And you and your sons with you shall guard your priesthood for all that concerns the altar, and that is within the veil. And you shall serve. I give your priesthood as a gift, and any outsider who comes near shall be put to death. So this is severe. Uh, we know that the, the tabernacle in the midst of the people of Israel was a big deal. And and we have to keep it holy. Remember, over and over and over again, as we went through the book uh, Leviticus, Vayikra, right? We went through the book Leviticus. We learned time and time again that it is important. You are a holy people and the tabernacle is holy. And, and there are things that are that within it that are holy. And you keep the holy things holy. You do not bring defilement onto the holy things. So this was part of Pinchas's responsibility. And this was the res responsibility of Aaron and his sons and the Levites and the priesthood, not just to minister to Yahweh, not just to minister to the people, not just to provide atonement for the people of Israel, and not just to teach the people about the Torah, but to keep things as they should be. Okay, um, you do not come and approach into the tabernacle or the temple in an improper manner. And they will remove you forcibly if need be. Okay, and it didn't matter who you were either. Um, we see some good examples of this throughout the scripture too. Remember King Uzziah, Second Chronicles twenty six sixteen to twenty one. But when he was strong, he grew proud, to his destruction, for he was unfaithful to Yahweh his God and entered the temple of Yahweh to burn incense on the altar of incense. But Azariah the priest went in after him with look at this. 80 priests of Yahweh who were men of valor. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to Yahweh, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from, Ye from Yahweh God. So here, uh, the king got a little bit... Too, his head got too big for him, is what it is. And he wanted to go in and offer incense to Yahweh. Now, is it honorable to want to worship Yahweh? Yes, absolutely. Is it honorable to uh, w want to do things in the way that he wants them done? See, that's it right there. He, he says, this is not for you, king. It doesn't matter that you're king. Uh, you're not above the law, so to speak. <laughs> so here, uh, it is the, the priest's responsibility to burn incense to Yahweh. If you wanted to bring an offering, you can do that. You bring it to the priest and make your offering. But to burn incense to Yahweh... This is not how it's done. And 80 men, 80 Levites, 80 priests came in and withstood him. Did the king need 80 men? I doubt it. But, uh, but here, I mean, that shows you the severity of it, right? And so what happens? Does the king uh, repent and say, oh, no, I, I didn't realize, and then leave and walk out? No. What happens? Verse 19. And Uzziah was angry, and now he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. But when he became angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead in the presence of the priests in the house of Yahweh by the altar of incense. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him, and behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they rushed him out quickly, and he himself hurried to go out, because Yahweh had struck him. And King Uzziah was a leper to the day of his death. And being a leper, he lived in a separate house, for he was excluded from the house of Yahweh. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's household governing the people of the land. So uh, he, he didn't get to burn the incense, right? But he just, the, the uh, I'm going to say the threat of it was severe. So severe that when he was uh, unrepentant for even wanting to do so, he was struck with leprosy. Now, he didn't die, did he? No, he didn't actually offer the incense. Could Yahweh have killed him? Sure. But I believe he was wanting to make a point, right? Uh, look at this. Arthur Wolak uh, from Hebrew University of Jerusalem, he states this. The priests and the Levites share the custody of the sanctuary. The priests guarding within and the entrance and the Levites guarding without. 
all the priests and Levites are responsible if disqualified priests or Levites encroach upon the sancta. Kohathite Levites are responsible for encroachment by Israelites while they carry the sancta, and all the Levites whose uh, cordons ring the encamped sanctuary are responsible for any Israelite encroachment. The penalty priests and Levites pay for failure to prevent encroachment is that of who? Not Avanavihu. Death by divine agency. There can be no question that there were certain dangers associated with functioning as a priest. So what happened to Not Avanavihu? Did they just uh, have a great idea to burn incense and go in to, to do that? No, see, they didn't even make it that far, did they? What does it say? Leviticus 10, Not Avanavihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and they put fire in it and laid incense on it. And they, and they offered unauthorized fire before Yahweh, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before Yahweh and consumed them, and they died before Yahweh. Then Moses says to Aaron, This is what Yahweh has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified, and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. So what is happening here, he's uh, not of an avihu. They, want, they go in to offer incense, but they put unauthorized fire. They didn't get the fire from the right place, and it was not their place to offer incense. There's a lot of midrash as far as what was going on here. The point of it, it says they were not to bring uh, unauthorized fire before Yahweh. It was not their place to do so. Whether if it was the right fire and the right incense, it was not their place. They're therefore still unauthorized. So they were operating outside of what they were anointed for service to do. And it cost them their lives. You don't mess with the holy things. Okay. And this is why it was, this was severe in, in, in Israel. Now it says because of Pinchas, because he did what he did, he says that he will give him a covenant of peace. And this is pretty interesting. If you look at it, a covenant of peace, uh, numbers 25, 11 and 12. So Pinchas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest has turned my wrath away from the children of Israel while he was zealous for my sake. That's an interesting phrase. Uh, among them that I consume not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore say, behold, I give to him my covenant of peace. Where it says, uh, zealous for my sake is uh, kinu et kinati. Uh, it's the same word for zealous and jealous. Same word. Okay, so uh, think about the uh, how, how this translates. Zeal can be jealous for Yahweh. Jealousy can act in zeal. So the question is, is it for the right reason? Is it for the right things? You can be jealous because of something that's happened to you, you know, yourself, and act unrighteously because of it. But here, he wasn't just uh, jealous for whatever reason. He was uh, zealous for the things of Yahweh and to keep the holy things holy. And to put it quite frankly, uh, if Pinchas had failed to do his job, he could have died. Quite possibly. All right. So here he's saying, because he acted in the way that he did, I will give him a covenant of peace. Now, peace is interesting. Let's take a look at this peace. Uh, some have said this isn't just protection from an external threat, but an internal one, not just uh, somebody attacking you, know, you, so therefore you don't have peace, but an internal peace as well. Because consider what he just went through. Consider what, what had just happened to him. And here he's got to uh, find a way to live with himself in this. So what does he need to do here? He has to find peace in the midst of this. Well, here he can find peace in saying, this is what Yahweh has instructed him to do. This is what he has told him to do. This is his ways. This is um, what he said. So he will give him the peace that he needs to live because of this, because if someone has taken a life, it's, it causes turmoil within you. And um, depending on how you, how you respond to it, depending on how you react to it, it can lead down a path of demoralization where it'll just spiral into, into a bad road, okay? Um, but he's, Yahweh says, no, because he acted with my zeal, I will give him peace. And not just peace, a covenant peace, all right? Second Timothy 1.7 says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You keep him in perfect peace, who? Whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. 
Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by what? Prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Messiah Yeshua. So what is peace? What is peace? Now we know peace is shalom, right? Well, we define peace as complete, whole, um, restored, right? Living at peace means doesn't mean there's no conflict. It means you're good, you're whole, complete. Okay. Now, if you look uh, in the old definition, like uh, Paleo Hebrew, uh, if you break it down by the letters, it says to peace is to destroy the authority that is connected or joined to chaos. And isn't that peace? It's not that there isn't any chaos around. It's not that things don't happen. It's just that it has no authority over you and in your life. Though you see things going on around you, you can have peace. Okay. All right. So a violent act brought about peace. There's no denying it. But this is not a blanket statement. And not every extreme act uh, needs to be dealt with like this. Okay, not, not, not every extreme act needs to happen this way. In Pinchas' life, he was uh, the grandson of Aaron, and he was to protect the sanctity of the Mishkan, ultimately the camp. For Yeshua, it was to restore life and order to his people. And, and yes, I made that connection. You see, what Pinchas did for the people of Israel, Yeshua did for the world. He helped stay the plague, the effects of the plague, the effects of the sin, and uh, made a way so that atonement could be brought on the camp and be brought in. Uh, we know Yeshua, he's called the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government... Uh, and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom, to order it, to establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth forever. The zeal of Yahweh Tzavaot will perform this. Again, the prince of peace and zeal that goes in together with it. So we are to be zealous for Yahweh, but we are to be zealous for peace. It doesn't mean that we are to lash out at everyone because we don't agree with what they're doing. Okay. What it does mean is the holy things needed to be protected and kept as holy. All right. Like Yeshua. I mean, you think about this. When he went into the, to the temple and uh, they were selling things there, it was not the issue of that they were selling things there. They were price gouging people that were there because the people were coming in for the festivals or coming in to bring their offerings. Uh, if they was too far of a journey to come with us, they would sell what they had, then get to Jerusalem and buy what they needed. Okay. So. It's not that they were buying the things for their offerings, it's that they were price gouging the people. They were taking advantage of them when they were just coming to worship. That was the problem. That was the issue. So Yeshua was zealous about this and he acted on it, didn't he? But notice this. He did not go into every home in Israel, start throwing out the idols in order to confront the, the ideologies of the, of the people. Okay. What he did was he acted zealously in his father's house. He dealt with the inappropriate behavior in his father's house. And uh, that, that's something that each of us need to keep in mind and do. And you can find this back in Mark eleven fifteen to 17. So what else did Yeshua say? Uh, Matthew 10, 34, Yeshua says, Don't think I've come to bring peace to the earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. But didn't he come to bring peace? So how does this relate? He didn't come to bring peace, but a sword, but he wants peace, but he has a sword, right? Well, let's, let's look at this. Let's break this down in context here. Uh, Yeshua's not talking about a sword like you would use in judgment or military action or even uh, personal violence toward one another. The word that's used here for sword is most often translated as like a knife or a dagger or something like that, a, a cutting utensil that was often used by fishermen. That should give us some kind of key to something that's going on, right? It was used by fishermen and uh, most often to separate uh, the cuts of meat and separate what they were doing there. So this sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Kind of like separating sheep from goats to separate those who will follow me and those who won't follow me, right? This, this term uh, to use this, this knife is the same term that's used in Hebrews 4.12. 
when it says the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing the division of soul and of spirit, joints of marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It's the same word that's used there. And the intent wasn't to kill. The intent was to divide for discernment, to separate. OK, so this is this is what he's saying. Now, he does say, blessed are the peacemakers, doesn't he? Matthew 5, 9, he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Zechariah 8, 12 says, For there shall be a sowing of peace, and the vine shall give its fruit, and the ground shall give its produce, and the heavens shall give their due, and I will cause the remnant of this people to possess all these things. Awesome stuff. James 3, 17 and 18 says, The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown how? In peace by those who make peace. So what we find here is that Pinchas, he was jealous for Elohim. And because he was jealous for Elohim, he, he acted in zeal for him. And this uh, made atonement for, for the people of Israel. All right. Numbers 25, 12 and 13. Therefore say, behold, I give to him my covenant of peace and it shall be to him and to his descendants after him, the covenant of a perpetual priesthood because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. And we know this because of all this, he has a covenant of peace, right? So there's something very interesting in, uh, in the Torah scrolls. And we find from Torah scroll to Torah scroll, it's going to be consistent Okay, um, and when you find this word peace, it's written in the scroll very different than you find it anywhere else. The the, uh, the vav that in the word shalom is written here, and it is broken. So it's shin lamed vav and a mem sofit. But the vav, if you look at it, it's broke, so it looks more like a yod and a bottom part of a vav. Now, this this kind of alludes to a, a hand. A yod is a hand and a spike or a, let's just say, a knife or a spike. So here we have a picture of one who brings peace to help make atonement for the people of Israel. And then the Vav, what does it represent? Vav, uh, being the sixth letter of the alphabet, represents six, which is the number of man, right? So it represents a man who is broken, who will have the, the, the his hand, uh, a hand will pierce him through with the sword. And in, in him, because he acted zealously, he, like Yeshua, he laid down his life. He acted in the zeal of Yahweh. So because he acted zealously, then he uh, makes atonement for the people of Israel. What, uh, amazing pictures we see here. And uh, again, a picture of what Yeshua did in order to bring us to the covenant of peace, which was to stop the effects of the plague. And uh, we see these connections between Pinchas and Yeshua in here. Amazing stuff. Numbers 25, uh, 12 and 13 again. I am giving him my covenant of shalom, making a covenant with him and his descendants after him. The office of Cohen will be theirs forever. Again, a office of priest forever, right? This is because he was zealous on behalf of his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. My prayer for us today is much like Psalm 29, 11, where it says, May Yahweh give strength to his people. May Yahweh bless his people with peace. May we truly seek peace in our midst, peace in our days, not our idea of peace, Yahweh's idea of peace, the way that he instructs it, which is hearts to follow him, hearts to live for him, hearts to see his kingdom here on earth. Let's keep our minds and our hearts and, and, and our thoughts, our actions, everything that we do, let's keep it focused on Yahweh and his ways, and uh, we'll have a much better place around us. We will have peace when we seek the Prince of Peace and make that a priority in our lives. When we're joining hands with Him, we're going to be joining hands with one another as well. May it all be for His name, for His glory, for His honor, right? Bashim Yeshua. Uh, blessings to you all. I hope this has been an encouragement and a challenge as well. So until next time, Shalom.